Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jennifer King Rice, Senior Vice President and Provost at the University of Maryland, and I am absolutely delighted for this opportunity to welcome you all to today's Sadat Forum, dis discussing Ukraine, Russia, and U.S. public opinion with our esteemed guest, Dr. Fiona Hill. Dr. Hill is an impactful and renowned expert on Ukraine and Russia, and as I learned in our prior conversation before this session started, so many other areas of the country. Uh, and so we are just absolutely delighted to have her here today to join us. Today's conversation with Dr. Hill will be led by our very own Professor Shibli Telhami. Dr. Telhami is the Anwar Sadat Chair for Peace and Development and Director of the University of Maryland Critical Issues Poll. He's a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. And so uh, Dr. Telhami uh, brings so much knowledge to these conversations. Before we get started, I'd like to take just a moment to acknowledge the relevance of this conversation in the wake of horrific events unfolding in the Middle East, resulting in unimaginable loss of life, including so many civilians and families. The impact of terrorism and war affects us all, near and far. And I know that many have close personal and family connections that have made this week particularly challenging and painful. As an institution of higher education, we must continue to work collectively to create a better world, rid of violence and hate, one that promotes peace and justice, inclusion and equality. And I believe firmly that solutions start with education and research the missions of our university. At the University of Maryland, through our education and research, we focus a lot on what we call the grand challenges of our time. In fact, one of the central commitments of our fearlessly forward strategic plan is to accelerate solutions to those grand challenges. Grand challenges include a range of enduring and complex issues like climate change and food insecurity, education and health disparities, structural inequality, threats to democracy, international conflict, and the list goes on. But part of what makes grand challenges grand is their interdisciplinary nature. They can't be solved with just one perspective or one approach, and they certainly can't be solved within academia alone. These problems require multidisciplinary collaboration between academics, policymakers, and leaders working together to study and advance solutions to these major social issues. That is precisely why the work that Dr. Telhami leads is so important and impactful because it addresses real and consequential challenges of international relations and conflict with the goal of working toward peace. We are reminded on a daily basis of the critical nature of this work, whether in the Middle East or in Ukraine or in other regions of the world that struggle with violence and conflict. And just as important is Dr. Telhami's work to inform citizens of our nation and the world about these issues so that they too can be part of the solution. So the critical issues poll, which provides data and findings that we'll hear about during today's conversation, truly drives both the study and the common understanding of some of the grandest challenges of our time. So thank you, Dr. Telhami, for your leadership. And of course, with us today is Dr. Fiona Hill who had previously joined us for the Sadat Forum in 2020. Dr. Hill hardly needs an introduction, but I will provide a brief one in any case. One of the most preeminent experts on Russia and Ukraine, Dr. Hill is currently the Chancellor of Durham University in the UK. And she is a senior fellow in the Center on the United States and Europe within the Foreign Policy Program at Brookings. She was previously Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European and Russian Affairs on the U.S. National Security Council from 2017 to 2019, and she served as a National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council from 2006 to 2009. Dr. Hill is a prolific author of multiple influential books and articles, including Mr. Putin, Mr. Putin Operative in the Kremlin, co-authored with Clifford G. Gaddy, and her latest memoir, There Is Nothing For You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century. We are absolutely proud to have Dr. Hill join us again for this, uh, for this forum, and I look forward to this timely and incredibly important discussion. I'll now hand over this forum to Dr. Telhani. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer, uh, for these kind words, um, uh, um, certainly about 
Fiona, they were um, certainly appropriate, but about me too and my work. Um, um, I, I want to welcome uh, Fiona, who is my friend and colleague and previous co-author, um, uh, someone I uh, have admired and learned from over the years. And I'm greatly appreciative, Fiona, of you taking the time to be with us. I know the demand on your time. Trust me, I know exactly the kind of demand that you're facing. But allow me before uh, we start our conversation um, to say something about a painful issue that's on many people's mind and uh, one that I follow very closely and write about and have been commenting about over the past few days. And the past few days, we have witnessed an intensity of violence in Israel-Palestine, the likes of which we have not seen in decades. Um, the shocking attack by Hamas on Israel and the ensuing Israeli bombings of Gaza have resulted in the brutal killing and wounding of thousands mostly civilians. This is a time to appeal to our common humanity, to overcome the urge of demonization that comes with destructive violence and to resist the hardening of our hearts that allows us to ignore the unbearable suffering of the other and to resist hate and the destructive urge for pure vengeance. No matter how just a cause might be, there's no excuse for targeting or recklessly endangering vulnerable civilians, whether they are Jewish or Arab, Israeli or Palestinian. Those in positions of influence, especially our own political leaders, must seek to rise above the natural urge for vengeance and speak with a clear moral voice that emphasizes our common humanity. Let me also say this to our proudly diverse Turk community that I love, and that includes Israelis, Palestinians, and other Arabs, Jews, Muslims, Baha'is, Christians, Druze from the region. These are painful times. Everyone has the right to grieve, to empathize with their loved ones and with those of the same heritage, and to have their own deeply held beliefs. Over the years, our Turk community has succeeded in giving each other space and maintaining a spirit of toleration, even in the midst of challenging crisis, we must resist expressions of hate and racism, even in moments of deep pain. And we can do this again at this painful moment. Uh, as our university president, Daryl Pines, has noted in his important message to our community, quote, support and resources are available to every member of our campus community. If you need help, please reach out to the counseling center or the faculty staff assistance program and look after your friends and colleagues who may be struggling as a community of care and a campus dedicated to service. Let us recommit ourselves to one another and to peace in our world, unquote. Now I, um, would like to turn to another painful issue, um, Russia and Ukraine. Um, obviously, the, the core subject here um, of hosting my friend and colleague, Fiona Hill. And Fiona, welcome again. Um, let me start uh, with a broad question. Um, and the question is, uh, first, let me focus on Russia, where it is now. I mean, um, it's been more than a year and a half since the war started. Um, uh, we know what some people expected. Um, initially, you know, there was a um, remarkable failure of the Russian military campaign. Uh, it led to a lot of optimism. Um, there was a rallying uh, uh, behind um, the Ukraine and in certainly in Europe, but in, in certainly in the U.S. as well. Uh, and um, there was some expectations that Russia would be weakened, that sanctions would weaken Russia, that the economy would weaken, that there would be pressure on Putin. Some people even dreamed of uh, somehow having alternatives to Putin. And uh, now, you know, we, we, in a few months, we're going to be turned two years through through the winter uh, season. And, and obviously, Putin is stronger than ever. Could you give us a little bit? Maybe not. Maybe I'm exaggerating. And I'd like you to give us a kind of a your assessment of where Russia stands right now. 
No, thanks very much, uh, Shibli. I mean, it's um, really great to be here. I mean, obviously, against the backdrop of everything happening in Israel and the Middle East, it's uh, an even more difficult time than it was when we envisaged having this discussion. And I'm sure as we uh, talk about this, we'll see the ways that this will also interconnect, collide, and um, you know, really perhaps even exacerbate the situation on the ground in, um, in Ukraine. Uh, because there's such a web here of relationships, which is actually kind of part of my answer to the question that you laid out. Um, you know, you you, you made, um, you know, as you said, a rather caveated assertion that uh, Putin is, uh, seems at least to be stronger than ever um, at, the, at this particular point. I think we'll be 600 days now into uh, the war. Uh, yeah. I think uh, we're somewhere in that the, that ballpark, or, um, you know, which is a pretty shocking. Uh, and, you know, it's right to actually look back over this and see what was intended in the first place and then you know, assess it on that basis. Putin still calls this a special military operation, although you know, increasingly there's the, the, the word war has been bandied around. Uh, he intended this to be over obviously very quickly because he didn't think he was launching a full on war. He really did genuinely think that as he sent in troops, that uh, there would be no resistance from Ukraine. And in fact, the Ukrainian political system was crumble. He had faulty information or he he heard and saw what he wanted to hear and see uh, in terms of assessments of how things uh, would play out. I don't think he, like anyone else, could really have anticipated the way uh, that uh, things would unfold. We've obviously um, seen uh, that this has created a lot of uh, stresses and strains in Russia as well. Those have been manifested in a multiplicity of ways. We had the uh, Prigozhin. Uh, revolt, Evgeny Prigozhin, uh, the head of one of the paramilitary formations, the Wagner Group, uh, all in the space of um, a couple of months launching uh, an insurrection, a coup, a putsch, we've called it all kinds of different things, uh, not because he wanted to topple uh, Putin, but because uh, he was dissatisfied with the way that the war was going. His um, uh, para, uh, paramilitary organisations, it's even hard to say who they, you know, they, they really are because it's a mishmash of everything from uh, you know, hardened commandos that have uh, become contract forces to um, cannon fodder literally dragged out of prisons to, to send uh, to the front. But uh, during the course of uh, this uh, this putsch and a march on Moscow, which uh, was seemed to be kind of ripped out of the headlines of earlier periods in Russian history, where you can see all kinds of revolts, you know, coming out of uh, a period of great upheaval. He tells some ground truths that there was no reason for uh, Putin, uh, Russia, he never says Putin at this point, of course, uh, to launch the war. And he's not there, you know, to uh, topple the government, but to demand that the uh, that the military leaders uh, who's been fighting with it on telegram channels uh, for, for months already, uh, the head of the, uh, the Russian chi chiefs of staff, General Gerasimov, the uh, head of the Ministry of Defense, Sergei Shoigu. He wants them removed because although the war was a mistake, Russia cannot fail, Russia cannot be seen to lose. And he and his group of the people who uh, want to prosecute this to the end, and there was obviously some sympathy in different parts of uh, the Russian military establishment for him. He shoots down a plane. I mean, people get killed on the way to there. But there's also bizarre pictures of people in the streets of the town he sets off uh, in and various places along the road taking selfies with him, like he's an influencer because he's a social media star. It's like he's a yeah. Robin Hood, a kind of a <laughs> rebel, a Bonnie and Clyde. There's a, there's a totally bizarre uh, set of images here that shows you multiple things at once. Once uh, one and the fragility of the system that something like this would happen, Putin's inability to keep all the tensions in check. And on the other hand, that Putin himself doesn't seem to be all that popular, that people will latch on to all kinds of you know, other people. The war's not popular. Everybody knows, or lots of people know it's a mistake. But the interesting thing, of course, is that he says, we still want to win it, we don't want to lose. And that then you know, kind of feeds into what we've seen in terms of this appearance of strength when you said that he seems stronger than before because there's some dimensions to this there's the economy russia now has a war economy but at the same time it's got you know pretty high inflation and the ruble has you know fallen to 100 uh, you know to the dollar you know for example because everything is being pushed into this war effort the patterns of trade have changed as a result of the sanctions uh, but Russia has adapted and it seems you know resilient in that regard i mean they can keep this going for you know quite a long time and where and this is where it uh, basically moves into the terrain of all the other issues that we're thinking about at the moment. Where is the locus of a lot of Russia's attention? Where's a lot of their money? Where have oligarchs that used to be previously in London or Cyprus and elsewhere gone? 
they've gone to the Middle East. They're in Dubai. They're in Doha. Uh, they've gone to Israel. A lot of people went to Israel from Russia as well. And a lot of Ukrainians, obviously, a lot of Ukrainian refugees have also gone to Israel. And we've seen harrowing pictures of people who were displaced from the conflict in Ukraine ending up now in the midst of the horrors of uh, the last few days. But, the, but what I would argue is that the Russian um, economy has become different. It's become distorted. Yes, it's adapting. It has, has a certain resilience. But over the long term, it's going to be very different. And Russia is on a very different trajectory from what we anticipated. They have very high casualty rates. Their demographic profile is going to be different. Uh, a million plus Russians have, have fled because they don't want to be conscripted. They're all over in the surrounding region. And um, although Putin in the sense of appearing strong enough to continue this war for a long time uh, could be said uh, to have you know, really prevailed here. Uh, I think there's a lot of cracks in that facade and it does raise the question of you know, other eventualities, other shocks to the system, just as we saw with Prigozhin that could tip things in a somewhat different direction. So I would just say we haven't seen the full picture yet. Um, and that brings me in a way to the Ukrainian side, because obviously, uh, when you say some contingency or events, unexpected events that could shake up the uh, or exploit the vulnerabilities that are hidden now, bring them to the forefront in terms of challenging Putin's authority. Obviously, a lot of it has to do with the with the war itself, and a lot of it has to do with the domestic environment within within Russia. Um, looking at Ukraine and uh, what we were expecting, um, you know, from Ukraine or in Ukraine at the beginning of the war and now, obviously, initially, everybody was shocked by how well they performed in stopping the initial Russian incursion, even before the arrival of huge amounts of weapons from the US and the West. Um, and there was a lot of optimism a, about their performance and their capability. Uh, they've done well early on, and now, obviously, been somewhat bogged down in a slow counteroffensive. Um, they've had... Um, domestic issues, um, uh, some corruption uh, charges, military uh, leadership reshuffling. Um, uh, you know, one doesn't really know the extent to which this has impacted uh, the, the domestic arena and the solidarity behind the war. But what is your assessment of that? Well, you know, when we use there in Russia and there in Ukraine, we're talking about two different things, which I think as people listening to this, they should bear in mind. The they in Russia in terms of persecuting the war is Putin and people in the Kremlin and people in the military. And as Mr. Prigozhin very kindly told everybody, this was based on a lie, a myth, on things that you know Putin was told or wanted to believe. He talks about um, corrupt generals and others, you know, wanting to make money off the war. As Prigozhin, that, that's not you know probably entirely accurate, but there's elements of this as well because we've seen, to be clear, great corruption also in the Russian military. There's been you know uh, pictures of tanks that have been substandard. Uh, you know where parts haven't been included you know i think the russian military hasn't been as much of a success as because there was a lot of lies about you know how well the military was performing we were all you know taken in by the spectacular success of russian rearmament over this long period since it invaded georgia back in 2008 and there was a kind of you know a lot of uh, discussion about all the new equipment uh, that russia had etc and a lot of it has proved to be substandard because you know we also did see sanctions put on uh, Russia for all kinds of components after 2014, when the war really started, when uh, Crimea was annexed, that have had an impact, as well as, you know, the corruption that has been rife within uh, that military system. But I said two theirs, right? So the other there in Ukraine, we are talking about they, the entire country. This is all hands on deck, uh, all part of society war. I said before that Russia has a war economy and things are being you know, push towards uh, the, the fighting that war. But there are lots of reports from on the ground uh, in Russia that people don't want to pay attention to the war. Uh, people talk about life in Moscow going on as it was before, somewhat different. You know, McDonald's is now called something else. Starbucks is, you know, being taken over into, you know, other things. You know, the Russians are still partying, you know, like uh, but basically nothing has happened. People talk about Kiev, you know, trying to go on as normal, but you still get the absolute sense in Ukraine from anyone who's been there, many of our colleagues from Brookings have and have written reports about this recently, that this is a country that's very much affected by this war. It's got an enormous um, refugee crisis. Um, at different points have been eight uh, million plus refugees, women and children in Europe. Some of those numbers have gone down because people have gone back. There's a similar number of people displaced internally. 
this is a country that's going to be irrevocably changed by this, even as I said, that Russia is going to be on a different uh, trajectory as well. And what you will get from most Ukrainians, and let's not, you know, kind of gloss it all over and say that there hasn't been corruption and there hasn't been draft dodging, you know, as we would have had, you know, in the United States during Vietnam. And we know during World War II, there was plenty of corruption and, you know, padded inventories, you know, etc. We know that these kinds of things happen. Ukraine was definitely challenged by corruption within the system uh, before the war, just as Russia and you know many other countries that were formerly part of the Soviet Union were because rule of law was not very well inculcated, inculcated there. But the main point here is that this is an all of society war. Everyone is in this. And Ukrainians are basically saying, yes, we've had all of this great suffering. The casualty rate is extraordinarily high. Uh, there's been uh, not just deaths and very high deaths of civilians, but also obviously the maiming of uh, many servicemen. These effects are not going to be, you know, erased uh, very easily. It's going to take generations. But you know, Ukrainians make it very clear that they do not want to succumb uh, to to Russia and to be subjugated by Russia. I mean, this is what we're talking about in the Middle East: is all of the different, you know, arguments about identity. Who wants to be who? Who wants to live in well, what territory? Uh, you know, this is an age old story we're seeing playing out. Ukrainians do not want to be Russian. And the Russian government has admitted that they've taken tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of Ukrainian children and, you know, basically taken them to Belarus or to Russia and trying to turn them into Russians. We've got all kinds of horrific stories from places like Melitopol or Mariupol, which was completely destroyed, the, the territories that are under Russian occupation. And you know, in the West, we've got a tendency now to talk about, well, we need to get this resolved. We could we could stop this by pulling away weapons. Let's not think that Ukrainians wouldn't continue to resist, because this is uh, for them their survival, their country. There is a they there in Russia. This is a much narrower group that are really carrying out a sort of fantasy and a, a viewpoint of of a group of people and a more passive reaction to it among the Russian population. Not one in terms of polling, the kind of polling that you do, Shibley, that's done in Russia that you know points towards any kind of change of heart anytime soon. But there's more of a sort of passive reaction to the war, no desire to lose, but really no desire for this to continue either. Yeah, that, that's clear. And that's really an important point. Uh, I think that um, many people miss when we talk about sort of what would happen if we reduce our aid to, to Ukraine. Um, I want to I want to get to the uh, the external arena, um, the international support for Ukraine, or lack of support for Ukraine. Um, let me start with the with the support for Ukraine. Obviously, um, the U.S. support has been central. I'm going to come to that a little bit later because that's obviously, in a way, our central issue here. I'm yeah. going to give the data as well, but um, th there is, um, you know, Western Europe obviously has been essential. Uh, NATO has been essential. This is a, and in in and NATO rallied in ways that you know was were quite impressive initially, more than people would have expected, honestly, given the state of NATO prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and in fact expanded to include Finland and Sweden. But we have also seen some tension uh, in Western European support for Ukraine lately. Obviously. Um, the rift with Poland, um, you know, maybe you could talk a little bit about how that impacted or, or continues to impact this, particularly given the political situation in Poland. It's not just a, it's a backdrop of something taking place in Poland. And then um, uh, the uh, Slovakia's elections. Um, okay. uh, and, and so we have the results of, you know, uh, uh, Russia supporting um, politicians in Slovakia. And, and so um, obviously, we've always had an issue with the, the attitude of, of Hungary on these issues. So I wonder um, how you assess European support for now toward Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, look, it's it's pretty complicated, as you've already laid out. And I think we also have to look at the broader international support, which maybe we'll get to, you know, with the United Nations. I mean, there was just a vote I think it was today, um, I'm just kind of having a quick look at here again, where Russia was, um, you know, obviously without um, any sense of irony, uh, trying to get its seat on the Human Rights Council again in the United uh, Nations. And um, there was a secret ballot held and uh, Russia didn't win uh, uh, to get a seat, but it still got 83 votes. And uh, the Russians keep claiming that, you know, the sort of, as they put it, the silent majority 
of the international community the biggest bulk of the population because you know those 83 votes are probably among you know very populous countries of the global south show that you know kind of russia has not been isolated and russia has not fallen uh, into uh, a pariah status that people um you know would um uh, would uh, otherwise state and we can also say that you know some european uh, countries like hungary you know have been very open I and mean, as you're sort of suggesting there in their affinity for Russia and the lack of uh, desire, uh, you know, to really, this is at the political level again. I mean, I, I, I would be more interested in seeing some of the polling, you know, to be to be frank. I mean, we often talk about when we say this is the they versus the they, right? The, right. the large population versus, you know, elites or, you know, uh, political um, uh, representatives. But, you know, certainly they're are very skeptical on that, you know, kind of elite and political level about Ukraine. And we've got to remember that Hungary actually has some territorial claims against um, uh, Ukraine uh, that have been expressed multiple times. I mean, they've even accused Ukraine of genocide of the Hungarian speakers in the uh, Transcarpathian Ukraine, Uzhgorod, you know, region, which is actually pretty preposterous. But, you know, it, it, it's kind of indicative of the fact that really kind of underpins what you're saying here, that different countries have different views of this based on their own interests, as is inevitable. History, culture, geopolitics, uh, the way that they see themselves uh, in their relationship to the European Union or NATO, for example. And you've mentioned Poland, which is you know particularly difficult at the moment because we're in the midst of a very heated, quite nasty uh, political campaign ahead of elections in Poland. And the Poles um, had previously, as you were already alluding to, seen the war in Ukraine as their war because so much of Ukrainian territory that ended up in uh, the Russian Empire in the Soviet Union was formerly part of the Polish Lithuanian Commonwealth or the Kingdom of Poland that was partitioned, you know, two or three times, you know, over uh, the uh, a historical sweep with Russia taking uh, Imperial Russia taking territory and others going to you know Germany or to Austria Hungary for example and the Poles you know felt quite rightly at different times that if Putin is saying he's basically winding back the clock on history and that Ukraine shouldn't exist. And given Poland's uh, history and, and very poor relationships over a long uh, sweep of time uh, with Russia, that they would have reason to be concerned as well. And they were expressing at the very beginning of the war that this was their war too, and all in uh, on uh, supporting Ukraine militarily, economically, etc., and taking in a, a large number of refugees. And we're already a large number of Ukrainians who'd moved to work in Poland you know, in the first um, uh, instance as well, but even before uh, the war. But, the, you know, the complexities have come into this political campaign. You know, um, it's been extraordinary and popular uh, having uh, for, for many farmers in Poland, which are the mainstay of uh, the ruling party, uh, Ukrainian grain flooding into the country because it's got nowhere else really to go after the breakdown of the Black Sea grain deal and Russia deliberately destroying uh, all of, uh, as much as it can, if not all of it, as much as it possibly can of, uh, Ukraine's agricultural infrastructure, port infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. I mean, Russia wants to wipe Ukraine out as a major producer of uh, of grain and uh, other commodities. One of the few routes out of uh, Ukraine, so that farmers can free up the remaining granaries and you know plant again for next year, is to get out through Poland and Slovakia and Hungary and all these other countries where we're actually seeing a backlash. Because then you've got uh, an influx through middlemen of you know what seems to be then cheap. Uh, Ukrainian grain flooding their markets and of course that becomes incredibly unpopular it's easy to whip up political tensions then there's you know errant missiles uh, here and there uh, especially in you know, places like Romania which is actually some of its own infrastructure has been hit by you know the Russians on the the Danube Delta and then you, you know you get the tensions by refugees and then it's just the political fodder uh, that uh, people can can use here to whip things up. We can be pretty sure that Russian uh, propaganda efforts have uh, have been at work here, but I think a lot of it is to do with the politics in um, in each of these countries. Saying, "Well, hang on, we've been giving all these refugees everything, we've been uh, giving Ukraine everything, and you know, instead, you know, we're we're getting backlash and we're getting problems. We've obviously seen in Germany and elsewhere." Uh, a massive shift away from Ukrainian uh, Russian gas, rather that was you know transported across Ukraine or through Nord Stream uh, one and two. We've had that you know uh, explosion of uh, of Nord Stream. You know, for example, the Hungarians have not turned away uh, from uh, the the Russian gas at all. They want to they want to keep it because it's important for the economy. None of these governments want to have economic consequences 
from the support for Ukraine. And that's easily turned into then, you know, kind of a, a real political morass. Ukraine, as in other countries, and we're going to talk about this, has become something of a domestic political football, despite the fact that people see that it's incredibly important for Ukraine to prevail, however, that manifests itself over the longer term and not to give you know, Russia a win because there has been massive shock across Europe. And I just want to say that as, even as we caveat all of the support, there's been a real sea change in Russia's relationships with Europe. And as I said at the very beginning, its economy has shifted. It has adapted and shifted. It's you know less tied to Europe and much more closely tied to the Middle East, which puts it in the mix of everything happening now and China and elsewhere and with you know, the global South countries like uh, South Africa and others that are part of the BRICS, Brazil, et cetera. Great. In fact, I want to ask you the next question about the BRICS and the global South um, before I get into the U.S. Um, just one final question on this, which is um, obviously that's U.S. had a great deal of support rallying European countries, uh, but has failed from the beginning to rally the global South and certainly the BRICS countries of which, of course, Russia is a member. In fact, to the country, BRICS has expanded recently yeah. to include countries, three countries that are considered to be uh, allies of the U.S., the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, and Egypt. Um, uh, and, and I'm just wondering, I'm looking at this um, in terms of the framing of the Biden administration. So what explains that? Uh, uh, Biden has framed the issue initially uh, in terms of defending a liberal international order. And there was a good reason for that, because it was a democracy versus authoritarianism, also rallying initially the democratic countries in the West and NATO, essentially. Uh, and so and he was successful at that. But of course, much of the world is illiberal. And um, and I'm just wondering whether the administration is somewhat erred in not focusing more about the international rules based order. And I'm contrasting this, you know, I wrote a piece um, uh, about a year ago, right after the war. Um, I wrote a piece comparing the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait in 1990 mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and yep. its implication for the world order. And remember, at the time, the issue of democracy didn't come up because you, Kuwait no, was in no, democratic no. countries, the allies right, were not democratic. Right, right. So it was all about defending the post-Cold War order, the emerging order, yeah. Yeah, you and the principle of sovereignty and the principle of occupation, opposition to occupation. Uh, and, and of course, the administration succeeded wildly. Even Russia signed, the Soviet Union, still the Soviet Union at the time, at the end of the Cold War, but it was still the Soviet Union. Even this, the Soviet Union signed on to the UN resolution. The US got a huge amount of support for, for its um, leading the war effort uh, against uh, Iraq. Uh, versus, of course, what happened uh, with Ukraine. Um, was that really, I mean, is, is, is there an issue here that um, I think to be talked about in terms of focusing more on rules-based order, the principle of occupation and sovereignty rather than, uh, and democracy is important to all of us, obviously, but, but in terms of the marketing, or is it that we have been substantially hurt by the 2003 Iraq war? Yeah, I was just going to say the that US? there was Iraq and then there was Iraq. Right. Uh, you know, our stance on uh, in defense of the rules based order in the first war, uh, Gulf War, was completely erased as far as many other actors in the world were concerned by uh, what they saw as, um, and I, I've heard all kinds of ways in which this has been uh, described, but let's put it as an abomination of uh, the second war. And in fact, this is precisely the problem that perhaps, you know, this administration you know, didn't realize, and in talking about values or talking about the liberal order, they were also holding the United States up, you know, to scrutiny here in terms of its failure to actually abide by those same rules and uphold that order in many of other actions um, in, uh, you know, largest sweep of history, but most uh, definitively for most countries in Iraq. I mean, we forget that, you know, despite the support of Tony Blair and, you know, other in a narrow group of leaders in uh, the United Kingdom, I mean, the country of my birth, a million people were on the streets, a million people on the streets of London protesting the war. And I don't think I ever met a single person in the UK outside of the government who was in the slightest bit supportive of that conflict. 
as well as you know many people being shocked uh, here and you you know uh, Shibli have you know noted this in your work and many others have as well it's a huge stain on the United States and many people see uh, out where in the BRICS countries and of course Iran is now you know joining all of that fray but um, we've got a bunch of colleagues at Brookings who've been uh, holding a series of dialogues, as you're aware, with representatives of other countries from South Africa and Brazil and you know, elsewhere, and it comes up every single time. Well, what about Iraq? Yeah. And they see Ukraine in that light. What is different, they say, from what you know Russia has done in Ukraine uh, and uh, what the United States did in Iraq? Well, we can say there's lots of differences and we do explain them, but the whole point is that the United States has not been enforcing uh, the rules-based order. People do still believe in the rules-based order, in fact, but they look at the United States and see that we haven't been upholding, you know, our end of the bargain, having been, you know, one of the uh, creators and founders of that post-World War II system. And so for Ukraine, the United States is an asset, but it has also become a liability. There's another element in which uh, the, it's worth um, inspecting as well, because the same goes for uh western europe or europe uh, at large and also for nato nato is seen elsewhere in the world as a tool um, of the united states and so russia's you know propaganda and information that it's all about nato um you know has has really you know taken a root it's also here in the united states and of course you know nato and nato expansion played a role but it's not all about nato uh just as you know kind of saying this has nothing to do with nato as you know pushing things to the other side but there's a lot of nuance and it's very difficult to explain this so elsewhere in the rest of the world they're saying well look this is just the united states trying to force ukraine into nato uh and uh and also you know invades countries all the time you know what's what's going on here this is a proxy war between the united states and nato and russia just fought out like vietnam or korea and you know play, pick your place uh in a different place there's nothing yeah. different now, the ukrainians have been trying to push back on their own recognizing all of this and basically say look we are fighting in a colonial war um this is you know kind of our old empire coming back and trying to recolonize us attacking us again and the rest of the world says Hang on a second. What? No, uh, because part of the problem is that Russia has been recognized, particularly in places like South Africa and elsewhere, as the continuing state of the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire before it did not colonize Africa or Latin and South America or, you know, it did actually expand its territory into Asia talk to the Chinese and the Japanese, you know, about and the Koreans about, you know, various, you know, kind of wars, uh, certainly around the margins there. But for the rest of the world, they see you know, Ukraine has lumped into Europe and, uh, and the United States and therefore a kind of a colonial power. I, we, I literally have had several discussions with senior uh, African uh, officials who said, look, Europeans don't get colonized, they colonize. We yeah. don't, uh, Ukraine should drop this. It's not working for them because they don't know Ukrainian history. Remember, there's that whole, you know, issue of Mike Pompeo telling, you know, Mary Louise Kelly of NPR that Americans can't find Ukraine on the map. I would actually expect a lot of Americans find Ukraine on the map, but a lot of people in Africa and Latin America uh, and elsewhere, of course, can't find Ukraine on the map. Why should they care about Ukraine? In fact, many yeah. of them say they don't really think about Russia until they get to the United Nations. They don't have think tanks. Their universities are not teaching Slavic studies. You know, obviously, uh, you know, their views of colonialization and empires are very different and you know they kind of lump all Europeans together as colonial powers despite the fact that the Irish the Welsh the Ukrainians the Finns you know there are a yeah. whole host of um, countries that have never had an empire and have been you know colonized by others or European countries that had European empires like the Swedes but didn't you know kind of or the Danes but didn't actually get down you know much further uh, outside of uh, Europe so it's very complicated and I think yeah. that, you know, Perhaps if we look back, we should have done a lot more of kind of focus groups. The kind of discussions that we're having now should have been done at the very beginning. And as you said, you should have, it's, 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 it's the substance of uh, these issues as well, but it's very much the communications. And on the substance front, you know, other countries, particularly in the UN uh, context, say, here you are, you're spending all of this money on Ukraine. You are all of this attention on Ukraine. You're not paying attention to climate change. You're not paying attention to high levels of debt uh, in the rest of the world or on all the strategic development goals that the UN has been promoting. You only care about European issues or Western issues. You don't care about us. We're kind of out of here. I mean, that, that's, we're hearing yeah. this all the time now. And I think, you know, what the war has shown is that 
there's been a massive system change. There's no desire for a hegemon. Countries don't want to get trapped between the US and China, and they don't want to be told what to do. And they want to see the US and Europe paying more attention you know, to their issues. And unfortunately, a lot less attention to Ukraine. So Ukraine has a much higher barrier you know, to well, why there's sympathy for Ukraine in many uh, settings. The Kenyan uh, permanent rep of the United Nations had an incredibly eloquent speech in defense of Ukraine, and Ukraine's still getting you know, more votes in favor in resolutions, but there is an awful lot of dissatisfaction, and it really starts with dissatisfaction with the United States. Yeah, and and obviously one of the criticisms of the Iraq war, of course, is one that uh, the 2003 Iraq war is one they invoke about double standards, but but the other obviously is the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories, which the global South countries often invoke. They invoked it even in, in the first Iraq war, but that's certainly one that you, right, and given what, what's happening now, all the horrors that are unfolding, right. uh, this is what I, you know, we said at the very beginning, there will be a lot more to the issue of Ukraine and Russia now connected to everything else that starts to happen, not least because of, you know, the involvement of Iran, you know, in all yeah. of this, Iran's support for Russia. Um, right. You know, kind of, in fact, I mean, Iran's kind of got Russia trapped because Russia yeah. is having issues in accessing, you know, weaponry. It was before a major arms seller. This goes back to, you know, what I said before, which just, anyway, it's, it's ramped up its own production, but it still needs components and parts and ammunition. And, you know, uh, countries like Iran and others can, you know, provide some of this now. And of course, you know, anyway, well, we, I think we all get the picture, right? This is going to be yeah. even more complicated, you know, than it was prior to, the horrors of uh, of Saturday. Undoubtedly, um, I want to just move now to um, the American side. Obviously, it's critical. Uh, this is central uh, for Ukraine for sure, and for the outcome of the war. Um, and part of it, obviously, is dependent on our public opinion, and part of it is dependent uh, in our politics, which. I will talk about both, but I want to start with public opinion, since, as you know, I've been tracking this, um, and I don't know whether that's one reason why I ended up on Putin's uh, sanctioned list. Uh, I don't know, because I'm, <laughs> all of our I, other Brookings because colleagues, of you, yeah. probably. Yes, I'm yeah. probably, <laughs> that might be. Uh, Guilt by uh, association. <laughs> yes. Hey. Uh, but, the, you know, in the public opinion polls, as you know, at the beginning when, when the war broke out, uh, there was remarkable support for uh, the the Ukraine in, in American public opinion. We did one in, instantly after the war started. And then, of course, not surprisingly, two months later, it dipped a little bit. In fact, I was I wrote an article saying, is this the beginning of, of war fatigue already? I, I wasn't sure. But then from that from that moment, from really March of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, 2021 uh, uh, to 22 to, to March um, uh, 23, uh, we had pretty consistent uh, uh, findings of, of steady support. Um, mm -hmm. And then from March to June, we had a bit of a drop right. um, that I noted. And then now I'm releasing for the first time a data that I've shared with you, and I'm going to show it on in a minute, um, which really... Uh, has a bit of mixed results, but more steady support since last June than I expected, in mm -hmm. all honesty. Mm -hmm. And so I want to I want to put that out and, and see. Let's start. I'm going to put the slide for everybody to see. Let me just put slide one. Um, and this question, as you know, is it says, how long uh, should the U.S. stay the course in supporting Ukraine? And, and I gave them a, a, you know, I'm here given the options of one to two years versus um, as long as it takes. Um, and you could see um, this is, um, uh, let's see, this is actually not the as long as it takes. Where's the, can we have the slide for as long as it takes? Uh, let's see whether that, um, this is the one to two years. Uh, let's come back to this. Uh, I, I can see the one, how long should the United States stay the course in supporting Ukraine as long as it takes? Oh, as long as it takes at the bottom, graphs. yes. Yeah, I think, yes, I, I don't I, have it showing up on your screen, on, but I think. On, on my screen, yes. Yeah, I, it's splitting two, yeah. Yes, so it's it's the number two. So you can see here. I mean, uh, it's pretty steady. Um, uh, I think this, and uh, as you know, this uh, this poll just ended October first. So, right. um, and this is with Ipsos. Um, this is our University of Maryland critical issues poll, mm -hmm. and you can see, you know, the um, slight increase. Although that obviously within the margin of error, it's you have to consider this to be steady. Um, so. Uh, and that's including Republicans and Democrats. So we have 
a pretty steady support. Let's look at the, the second slide, um, which is um, how do you feel about the current level of US military expenditures in support of Ukraine? Um, so take a look and, and, and look at the results um, here. Um, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the, let's see where the options are. Yeah, you've got it's too much, it's too little, and it's about the right level. Yeah, it's it's just not showing for some reason on my. And I think screen. on yours because it's probably projected on so that the everyone who's yeah. they can see. And Let as I'm just, a participant uh, as well, I can see it. Yeah. Yeah, I should actually look at my own um, at my own slides here, but uh, yeah, too much and too little, um, and you could see anyway that um, you know. Uh, uh, there's really no change. Um, if you look at it again, there's no change uh, in uh, the level of support since June. Um, and, and that's true, you know, across the board. So that's kind of interesting in and of itself. Um, and let's look at the next slide, um, which is, what is your impression of the performance of the following parties in the Ukraine war? And this is about Russia is failing and Ukraine is uh, succeeding. Let me tell you why we have this measure. Of course, the public doesn't really know whether Russia is, is failing or succeeding, but the, the, the public forms a perception based on the coverage from the press, what politicians yeah. say, um, what the Ukrainians say, what the Russians say. And that impression we found throughout our polling to be highly correlated with the degree of support. The more they think Russia is failing, the more they uh, want to support Ukraine. The more they think uh, Ukraine is succeeding, the more they want to support Ukraine. So those two measures about fa Russia failing and Ukraine succeeding have been essential. So to the extent that there is a change here, it is interesting, not in the overall, because when you look at the total public, uh, all respondents, there's no change within mm -hmm. the margin of error, the changes within the margin of error. But there is a bit of a troubling shift within Democrats. So if you look at yeah. Um, uh, you know, a drop from 48 to 43% about Russia is failing and a big drop in Ukraine is succeeding uh, uh, from 39 to 31% in September, October. And then one final slide I'll show before I ask you to react, um, which is a question that we only asked this time because of, it was about the counteroffensive. And we knew actually in the spring that a lot of people were expecting a counteroffensive to see um, what, how it impacts, um, you know, the the uh, calculus of people in terms of success or failure of Ukraine, uh, and I was obviously initially people were hopeful that uh, the counteroffensive is going to be more successful. It, it seemed to have bogged down maybe more than people were expecting uh, before, at least the public. But surprisingly, it, it's not uh, as bad as I may have expected because actually it looks like a plurality of the public, 38% say it's been somewhat effective, uh, only 5% say very ineffective, and 9% say somewhat ineffective. So uh, obviously a lot of don't knows that you expect a question like that, about 30%. But it, you know the perception about the counter offensive, it is more that it's more successful mm -hmm. than not successful, uh, including among the Republicans. So that's interesting mm -hmm. and, and obviously promising from the point of view supporting Ukraine. Any reactions you have? Yeah, there's a number of reactions. And I mean, I know that you, you know, delve into a lot of the details in this. I mean, you just said yourself that a lot of it is shaped by whatever people are hearing politicians say, and that uh, might, you know, very well, you know, um, uh, I, I think um, underlines some of the, you know, issues and differences between Republicans and Democrats, obviously, given, you know, the, the fact that we're right in the middle now of um, our presidential election campaign, and this has become a domestic political issue, just like, you know, we already said it is in Poland or has been in Slovakia and, you know, in Hungary and, you know, elsewhere where, you know, inevitably this is part of uh, the fabric of uh, politics. Also in the media. I mean, you know, um, there is a lot of um, selectivity in the way that um, this is covered by uh, different organizations. Some um, newspapers that uh, people are reading have a correspondence on the ground, others get it from wire feeds. A lot of people, particularly in younger generations, and I know that you've got some kind of age breakdowns, you know, getting their information from YouTube and Instagram. 
you know, I, I mean, I have a 16 year old daughter and I was saying, how do you know this? <laughs> so I know she's not reading the paper because I don't see her reading it, you know, so, but she, she says, you know, mom, I think you think I'm an idiot. I do know things. I said, well, where do you hear it from? You know, so, you know, we, we're seeing now from the Middle East, you know, people who are posting to Instagram and, you know, TikTok and YouTube, you know, and are shaping, you know, the way that people think about things. Uh, influencers, you know, this is the, you know Russian propaganda. I've got a lot, we've got a lot of colleagues at Brookings who are looking to see how Russian propaganda uh, plays out on uh, on YouTube or in podcasts. You know, for example, where do people pick information up from? You know, that's kind of you know part of the issue. But there's an interesting element that you said there about um, that correlation between perceptions of failure or success. You know, and support going up. It's a feature of America, right? Um, I mean, yeah. first of all, we 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 are in favor of freedom, and we are against bullies. We like to support the underdog, but we always feel good if our side's winning, mm -hmm. or it's being seen to win. And it's very hard to explain in this context what a win is. I mean, I get asked this all the time, and I'm off to Peoria, Illinois, where you know there used to be that was it, um, politics 101. You know, kind of what do they think in Peoria, the dead center of the country? And I'll, I'll be interested to see what people you know are saying there. But there's this you know kind of feeling you know there about you know it's about how informed people are, how they perceive themselves, how they're perceiving, how they're feeling, you know, about the world. Um, you know, I, I don't I don't think that people can really kind of grasp what a win or what a loss is in this context. I mean, Ukrainians have said we want to get all of our territory back. It seems hard for people to to see that's going to be the case. And in fact, every war that we think of, uh, major wars, World War One, World War Two, other uh, wars, uh, many of which the United States has been involved in. Uh, think about the wars of you know the uh, you know the, the the wars with Spain that the United States had, all re resulted in territorial changes. So I think there is a lot of people you know thinking with doubt. Well, are the Ukrainians really going to be able to get all of the territory back? And, you know, in many respects, of course, everyone says Ukraine has already had a moral win. Of course, that's absolutely true. Ukraine has stopped Putin from doing what he thought he was going to do with his special military operation to completely take over Ukraine and by now have someone else installed as the um, president of Ukraine and Ukraine probably becoming part of a union treaty along with Belarus of Russia and, you know, bye bye Ukraine, basically. But there's also then that sense of just the huge casualty rate. So I mean, as we're looking at the horrors in the Middle East, you know what you and you know your colleagues said at the very beginning the enormity of the human crisis here the tragedy um uh, well it's not an act of god it's basically a man-made tragedy a catastrophe all of the people who have been maimed uh, as well as died the refugees there seems to be no winning going on in this kind of context and i think that that you know gets down to the difficulty i mean it's interesting when we start thinking about you know various politicians they don't want to be seen to be backing a losing proposition because it starts to then reflect negatively on them. And I think that that's kind of, if you can't, you know, really say how Ukraine is winning and how Russia is losing, and, you know, Russia is all out there because for Putin, he has to seem like a winner, right? He has to be constantly pointing to all the ways in which he's winning. Then, you know, that gets uh, part of the complexity there because it's very hard to, to cut through all of this. I know you have to leave at three sharp because you have to travel. And thank you again for joining us so uh, you know, given given your tight schedule, uh, I just want to uh, give you the last few minutes chance to talk about your worries about our politics right now. Obviously, uh, the eight Ukraine is caught up in Congress. Um, uh, we have, um, you know, political season where facts seem to go out of the window. And uh, it's all about winning and losing at home first. Yeah. Uh, and not about uh, the reality that we face and not necessarily about our national interests. And uh, I wonder how you see it, and what are your fears and, and expectations in the in the months ahead? Well, there's obviously a lot of fears that um, I think all of us have on the, about the dysfunction of American politics, and you know whether the country's become un ungovernable, and whether we have, in many respects, already a soft secession of uh, various states, and um, you know the unraveling of the United States. Yeah, you know, I'd always get Russians in the past, you know, saying, "Well, the United States has fallen apart." They're always talking about. California seceding or Texas seceding. I mean, that's really kind of not exactly accurate because what's happening is states are pulling away from each other and our politics is becoming radicalized as well. Uh, you know, we, we don't have the same rules, regulations or, you know, freedoms or, you know, all kinds of issues from state to state. We've got massive inequality. 
uh, that's uh, only um, deepening. Although you know this administration has tried very hard you know to reverse a lot of this with um, you know some pretty major policy interventions, but people are not feeling that they're not seeing that. And it's the radicalization of politics, the uh, high risk of communal violence uh, that, you know, I'm, I'm considerably worried about here. And just everything is a hot button issue. And Ukraine is part of that with guns and abortion and everything else. And, you know, as we look at the horrors in the Middle East, you know, that's going to start playing in our politics as well, because we're not robust and resilient enough to stop things from reverberating in a major way. And on the outside, all of our weakness and our inherent contradictions exacerbate the situation because you know right now we're not really seen as the leader of anything and yet we've seen how important american leadership is for rallying support for ukraine where we you know we've got a, a carry group off uh, the coast of, of israel right now people are still looking to the united states to lead to assist to you know give some direction and yet they have no idea where we're headed uh, i spent five months in uh, germany um, up until the summer, the question I was asked all the time was what's going to happen in 2024? How do I know? You know, that's the problem. How do any of us know this particular moment? We seem incredibly unreliable, unpredictable, capricious and dangerous. And, and that's kind of something that is a bit of a shock for most Americans to think that the rest of the world, even our allies, see us as dangerous in our unpredictability and in our lack of unity. And, you know, at a time when the world, you know, seems on a teetering around in an apple up, up you know, apocalyptic manner, with climate change uh, and all of the evidence of uh, climate catastrophe mounting and conflicts on every front. And there are, I mean, there are so many conflicts of the way. And we, we have talked only about Ukraine, but we have Ethiopia, we have Sudan, we have Niger, we have all kinds of uh, coups and uh, Haiti, you know, for example, now, you know, the Middle East back again, never really went away. We could go on and on, you know, around the globe, although there are many positive developments on many fronts. There's a neat, an overwhelming sense of crisis now, of the system having changed and there being no there there. You know, so although there's no desire for a hegemon, this is of course the irony, there is still a desire for American leadership and certainly for American stability. Perhaps not in China and in Russia and Iran, but in a lot of other parts of the world, they'd much prefer that we had our act together than we don't. Well, that's a sobering moment to end on. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Fiona. Um, I am grateful for your uh, friendship, for uh, you, the time you always give us, your advice, your thoughts, um, and I look forward to another opportunity to do it again. Thanks, Shibli. And I mean, I hope that everyone will take um, a good look at uh, your polling. I mean, it's been really excellent. And Thank uh, you. obviously your polling on the Middle East as well has really been extraordinarily helpful for helping people understand you know, what's happening on so many fronts. So thank you for the opportunity to, to join everyone today. Pleasure to have you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.